Welcome, my darlings, to my humble chateau. Please make yourself very comfortable. Relax your mind and release your imagination to me. I will bring you a story to entrance and entertain. Perhaps a frightening one. Perhaps a steampunk. Perhaps a bit of mythology. Anyway, sit back. Enjoy. Enjoy. And subscribe. A Shadow Over Innsmouth. Chapter 5. Final Chapter. It was a gentle daylight rain that awakened me from my stupor in the brush-grown railway cut, and when I staggered out onto the roadway ahead, I saw no trace of any prints in the fresh mud. The fishy odor, too, was gone. Innsmouth's ruined roofs and toppled steeples loomed up grayly towards the southeast but not a living creature did I spy in all the desolate salt marshes around. My watch was still going and told me that the hour was past noon. The reality of what I'd been through was highly uncertain in my mind, but I felt that something hideous lay in the background. I must get away from the evil shadowed Innsmouth, and accordingly I began to test my cramped, wearied powers of locomotion. Despite weakness, hunger, horror, and bewilderment, I found myself after a long time able to walk, so started slowly along the muddy road to Rowley. Before evening, I was in the village, getting a meal and providing myself with presentable clothes. I got the night train to Arkham, and the next day talked long and earnestly with government officials there, a process I later repeated in Boston. But the main result of these colloquies in public is now familiar, and I wish, for normality's sake, there was nothing more to tell. Perhaps it is madness that is overtaking me, yet perhaps a greater horror, or a greater marvel, is reaching out. As may well be imagined, I gave up most of the four planned features of the rest of my tour. The scenic, architectural and antiquarian diversions of which I had counted so heavily, nor did I dare look for that piece of strange jewelry said to be in the Miskatonic University Museum. I did, however, provide my stay in Arkham by collecting some genealogical notes I had long wished to possess. Very rough and hasty data, it is true, but capable of good use later on when I might have time to collate and codify them. The curator of the historical society there, Mr. E. Lapham Peabody, was very courteous about assisting me and expressed unusual interest when I told him I was a grandson of Eliza Orne of Arkham, who was born in 1867 and had married James Williamson of Ohio at the age of 17. It seemed that a maternal uncle of mine had been there many years before on a quest much like my own, and that my grandmother's family was a topic of some local curiosity. There had, Mr. Peabody said, been considerable discussion about the marriage of her father, Benjamin Orr, just after the Civil War, since the ancestry of the bride was particularly puzzling. That bride was understood to have been an orphaned Marsh of New Hampshire, a cousin of the Essex County Marshes, but her education had been in France and she knew very little of her family. A guardian had deposited funds in a Boston bank to maintain her and her French governess, but that guardian's name was unfamiliar to Arkham people, and in time he dropped out of sight so that the governess assumed his role by court appointment. The French woman, now long dead, was very taciturn, and there were those who said she could have told more than she did. 
But the most baffling thing was the inability of anyone to place the recorded parents of the young woman, Enoch and Lydia Meserve Marsh, among the known families of New Hampshire. Possibly, many suggested, she was the natural daughter of some Marsh of prominence. She certainly had the true Marsh eyes. Most puzzling was done after her early death, which took place at the birth of my grandmother, her only child. Having formed some disagreeable impressions connected with the name Marsh, I did not welcome the news that it belonged on my own ancestral tree, nor was I pleased by Mr. Peabody's suggestion that I had the true Marsh eyes myself. However, I was grateful for the data, which I knew could prove valuable, and took copious notes and lists of book references regarding the well-documented Orn family. I went directly home to Toledo from Boston, and later spent a month at Maumee recuperating from my ordeal. In September, I entered Oberlin for my final year, and from then on till the next June was busy with the studies and other wholesome activities. Reminded of the bygone terror only by occasional official visits from government men in connection with the campaign which my pleas and evidence had started. Around the middle of July, just a year after the Innsmouth experience, I spent a week with my late mother's family in Cleveland, checking some of my new genealogical data with the various notes, traditions, a bit of heirloom material in existence there, and seeing what kind of connection chart I could construct. I did not exactly relish the task, for the atmosphere of the Williamson home had always depressed me. There was a strain of morbidity there, and my mother had never encouraged my visiting her parents as a child. Although she always welcomed her father when he came to Toledo, my Arkham-born grandmother had seemed strange. And almost terrifying to me. I do not think I grieved when she disappeared. I was eight years old then, and it was said that she had wandered off in grief after the suicide of Uncle Douglas, her eldest son. He had shot himself after a trip to New England, the same trip, no doubt, which had caused him to be recalled at the Arkham Historical Society. This uncle had resembled her, and I never liked him either. Something about the staring, unwinking expression of both of them gave me a vague, unaccountable uneasiness. My mother and Uncle Walter had not looked like that. They were like their father, though poor little cousin Lawrence, Walter's son, had been an almost perfect duplicate of his grandmother before his condition took him to permanent seclusion of a sanatorium at Canton. I had not seen him in four years, but my uncle once implied that his state, both mental and physical, were very bad. This worry had probably been a major cause of his mother's death two years before. My grandfather and his widowed son Walter now comprised the Cleveland household, but the memory of older times hung thickly over it. I disliked the place and tried to get my research done as quickly as possible. Williamson records and traditions were supplied in abundance by my grandfather through the Orne material I had depended on my Uncle Walter, who put at my disposal the contents of all his files, including notes, letters, cuttings, heirlooms, photographs, and miniatures. It was going over the letters and pictures on the Orne side that I began to acquire a kind of terror of my own ancestry. As I have said, my grandmother and Uncle Douglas had always disturbed me. Now, years after their passing, I gazed at their picture faces with a measured, heightened feeling of repulsion and alienation. I could not at first understand the change, but gradually, a horrible sort of comparison began to obtrude itself on my unconscious mind, despite the steady refusal of my consciousness to admit the even least suspicion of it. 
It was clear that the typical expression of these faces now suggested something it had not suggested before, something which would bring stark panic if too openly thought of. But the worst shock came when my uncle shooed me the orange jewelry in a downtown safe deposit vault. Some of the items were delicate and inspiring enough, but there was one box of strange old pieces descended from my mysterious great-grandmother, which my uncle was almost reluctant to produce. They were, he said, of a very grotesque and almost repulsive design, and had never, to his knowledge, been publicly worn, though my grandmother used to enjoy looking at them. Vague legends of bad luck clustered around them, and my great-grandmother's French governess had said they ought not to be worn in New England, though it would be quite safe to wear them in Europe. As my uncle began slowly and grudgingly to unwrap the things, he urged me not to be shocked by the strangeness and frequent hideousness of the designs. Artists and archaeologists who had seen them pronounced the workmanship superlative and exotically exquisite, though no one seemed able to define their exact material or assign them any specific art tradition. They were two armlets, a tiara, and a kind of pectoral, the latter having in high relief certain figures of almost unbearable extravagance. During this description, I'd kept a tight rein on my emotions, but my face must have betrayed my mounting fear. My uncle looked concerned and paused in his unwrapping to study my countenance. I motioned him to continue which he did with renewed signs of reluctance. He seemed to expect some demonstration when the first piece, the tiara, became visible. But I doubted if he expected quite what actually happened. I did not expect it either, for I thought I was thoroughly forewarned regarding what the jewelry would turn out to be. What I did was to faint silently away just as I had done in that briar-choked railway cut a year before. From that day on, my life has been a nightmare of brooding and apprehension. Nor do I know how much is hideous truth and how much madness. My great-grandmother had been a marsh of unknown source whose husband lived in Arkham. And did not old Zadok say that the daughter of Obed Marsh, by a monstrous mother, was married to an Arkham man through a trick? What was it the ancient topper had muttered about the likeness of my eyes to Captain Obed's? In Arkham, too, the curator had told me I had the true Marsh eyes. Was Obed Marsh my own great-great-grandfather? Who or what, then, was my great-great-grandmother? Perhaps but perhaps this, this was all madness. Those whitish gold ornaments might easily have been brought from some Innsmouth sailor by the father of my great-grandmother, whoever he was. And that look of staring eyed faces of my grandmother <sighs> and self-slain uncle might be sheer fancy on my part. Sheer fancy bolstered up by the Innsmouth shadow which had so darkly colored my imagination. Why had my uncle killed himself after an ancestral quest in New England? For more than two years, I fought off these reflections with partial success. My father secured me a place at an insurance office, and I buried myself in routine as deeply as possible. In the winter of 1930-31, however, the dreams began. They were very sparse and insidious at first but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great, watery spaces opened out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopsian walls with grotesque fishes as my companions. Then the other shapes began to appear, 
filling me with nameless horror the moment I awoke. But during the dreams, they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them, wearing their unhuman trappings, treading their aqueous ways and praying monstrously at their evil sea-bottom temples. There was much more than I could remember, but even what I did remember each morning would be enough to stamp me as a madman or a genius if I dared write it down. Some frightful influence I felt was seeking gradually to drag me out of the same world of wholesome life into the unnameable abyss of blackness and alienage. The process told heavily on me. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd nervous affliction had me in its grips, and I found myself at times almost unable to shut my eyes. It was then I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began to look at me curiously and almost affrightedly. What was taking place in me? Could it be that I was coming to resemble my grandmother and Uncle Douglas? One night, I had a frightful dream in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace of many terraces, with gardens of strange leprous coral and grotesque brachiates efflorences, and welcomed me with a warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed as those who take to the water change, but told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to a spot her dead son had learned about and had leapt to the realm whose wonders, destined for him as well, he had spurned with a smoking pistol. This was to be my realm, too. I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man walked the earth. I met also that which had been her grandmother for 80,000 years. But they and Thiyi had lived in Yahanathli, and thither had she gone after Obed Marsh was dead. Yahanathli was not destroyed when the upper earthmen shot death into the sea. It was only hurt, but not destroyed. The Deep Ones could never be destroyed, even though the paleogenic magic of the Forgotten Old Ones might sometimes check them. For the present, they would rest. But someday, if they remembered, they would rise again for the tribute Great Cthulhu craved. It would be a city greater than Innsmouth next time. They had planned to spread and had brought up that which would help them. But now, they must wait once more for bringing the Upper Earthmen's death. I must do a penance, but that would not be heavy. This was the dream in which I saw a Shagos for the first time, and the sight set me awake in a frenzy of screaming. That morning, the mirror definitely told me I had a the Innsmouth look. So far, I have not shot myself as Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step. But certain dreams deter me. The tense extremes of horror are lessening, and I feel queerly drawn towards the unknown sea deeps instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in sleep and awake with a kind of exaltation instead of terror. I do not believe I need to wait for the full change as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. Lorelei Cthulhu 
the wagon. La, la. No, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from the Canton Madhouse, and together we shall go to the marvel-shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out to that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through black abysses to Cyclopsian and many-columned Yehathali. And in that lair of the Deep Ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever! So quoth this raven. Oh, I know some of you saw this coming, didn't you? Poor, poor man. Or is he? Hmm. Beauty always fades, my darling. Ah, but the stench of fish, my darlings, can last forever. <laughs> if you have any requests, sci-fi, horror, anything in the public domain, or if there's a story on Reddit you'd like to hear, anything at all, let me know. And comment if you want to hear from me. Like and subscribe. And ring the little bell so you'll know when to come up and see me. Bye-bye, <laughs> my darlings. <laughs>